Right. No questions about uh, about the column business that we started on uh, on Friday. All right. Let's do a little bit of warm up one. Um, one. I want you to size a column, a square column, uh, and we'll we'll use wood. So find the size for a square column under two different possible loadings, just to just to get things going here a little bit. Um, remember, uh, it depends a lot on Young's modulus. Um, we'll use a factor of safety of 2.5. Pretty standard. 1.5 is actually cutting it a little short sometimes. Length of two meters, about a six foot column, so about something you'd have on a deck. And then uh, allowable normal stress of uh, 12 megapascals. All right, let me make sure I got those right. 13, oh no, sorry. Yeah, gigapascals. Looks like grandpa. 13 grandpas. Uh, all right, two loads for 100 kilonewtons and for 200 kilonewtons. Um, so we'll keep it a square post. So the the uh, moment of inertia is easy. Um, so I just want you to find a square post. Recommend with the side bag. Obviously, quarter sawn oak because that's that's what that picture looks like. That looks like quarter sawn oak. If you ever saw it before? Not red oak. That's a that's a golden oak kind of uh, common color here in the Northeast. If you're all thinking that. Frank, how's your foot doing? Okay. Where'd you get a hat from Colorado? Uh, I don't know. Stole, beat up some little kid at the mall for it? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we had that critical load equation. A couple different ways to apply the, the 2.5 factor of safety, but they all work out about the same in the end as long as you do it the same direction. So based on those as the critical loads, come up with a, an appropriate uh, column dimension for a square column with those properties. get by without the slenderness ratio, that doesn't really change anything terrifically. Uh, it was kind of an algebra thing. But, uh, we just start with our original critical load for Collins equation like up on the board and just do straight away. And for uh, a square profile, 
uh, square cross section I over A reduces to some pretty simple numbers. Gee, Frank, good thing it turns almost over. You're almost out of pencil. Okay. Go beat up another kid and get a new one for next year. Got their summer plans. What is that? L value? The length of the column. Remember, the longer the, the, the height of the column. I don't even know what are we looking for. You're looking for the dimension of the square column that will support these two loads, given those properties and, and parameters of the problem. So essentially, it's just this. I've already given you the load. You need to apply uh, factor of safety. E you've got, uh, L you've got, I over A for a square column reduces to a pretty simple number. Like this one. It's kind of a warm up. But, no, that's the same one. Remember that uh, that had the slenderness ratio in it using the radius of gyration, which you don't have to use because that was just sort of an algebraic change in this equation. It was just a, a slightly different way to look at the, the same problem. No, Doobie? units check the units make sure no you're right where did I get the A and here I go again no with I in there uh, oh no! I'm sorry. Yep, uh, that's that's actually for the uh, normal stress. That's what that one is. That's why I looked at, uh, at the wrong one. Yep. So that one will do it. That's about as, as simple as we can get. safety
one of these in for the critical load and maybe multiply the uh, factor of safety by it. So you've got the, the higher one you're protecting. E's given, I is unknown because that's dependent upon the dimension A. So you can solve for A from that, from I. Should I divide the allowable stress by the 
did you already use the tack your safety ID? I did. Don't use it again. Okay. Use it once. So there's there are different ways to use it, but as easy as anything, it's just multiply the expected load by the two and a half. Then we're designing for a greater expected load. More safety. I for a square column. It's one twelfth eight of the fourth, right? Because it's BH cubed, but B and H are the same since it's square. And then uh, you can then solve. So for that one, you got 117, no, uh, 98 something millimeters. Just call it 100. However, you've got to check for the normal stress limit as well. Normal stress is 12 megapascals, so you need to check. that allowable stress is less than the uh, uh, normal stress expected with this beam. same numbers 25.9 oh you well you use the 98 down here yeah, yeah. So. That, that's close enough you know you don't want to be cutting this the uh, critical loads already in there I mean uh, the factor safety is already in there so you don't want to be cutting this any closer than that comes out to be just the 25 kilopascals megapascals so we're well That's 25 megapascals. Okay, so almost uh, almost double the the allowable shear stress. So you're going to need to beef that beam up as well. One way you can look at this is that there's a, a shear stress limit 
we didn't look at as L over R, but the, the, the general idea is the same. There's a buffling limit that looks something like that, where as long as you're inside of that curve, you're going to be okay. But below a certain point, you have the allowable or the yield normal stress limit so that the real design curve then looks like that. As long as you're in here somewhere, you're okay for the normal stress concerns. After a, after a certain point, after a certain slenderness ratio, even if you didn't use it for this calculation, there's no numbers on that. Uh, buckling is a concern on one side. Uh, normal stress failure, yield stress on the other side. Uh, some, some sort of division in between. All right. Um, one other concern with these, and then we're all done, is that the model we initially used for this is, of course, a bit artificial in that no one really makes a beam that's simply pinned at both ends. you're much more likely to make a beam that has different uh, methods of fastening there or up there as well. So there's other couple possibilities. So we uh, define an equivalent length where if you have other certain type of um, support methods at the top or the bottom, then you change the equivalent L and then use that number in the straight calculations as before. The, the very same ones we've got there. For this, where it's pin top and bottom, that's the type of mounting that we use to come up with this anyway. So for that case, that's our base condition of L equals 1. Nothing would have changed. That's what we're assuming for uh, this column support method anyway. Another possibility is that we model it as pinned at the top. And embedded at the bottom. Maybe if it's a... Uh, uh, a metal one could be wo wo uh, welded there. If it's uh, in a cement base, it could be sunk into the floor itself. The point being that this kind of loading, the, uh, this kind of support, can offer some uh, moment, which will make things a bit stronger than the uh, simply pin one. And in this case then LE is reduced a little bit. And we can imagine an even stronger, uh, it, it's kind of like getting 30% uh, beam strength for free, if you will, because of that change in the number. Another possibility is that same kind of support at the bottom, but at the top, uh, sort of a, a, a uh, sort of the same type of thing. But remember, uh, 
allow for for uh, strain uh, shrinkage due to the compression of the beam itself. But this model moment support at both ends reduces it even farther. So it's like getting uh, twice as much beam for free, if you will. And then one last possibility is that of a beam that's uh, got an embedded type support at the bottom and we model it with no lateral support at the top, which is what this channel type thing was supposed to, to represent. The fact that the beam couldn't, the beam top couldn't go side to side, it could only go up and down as the beam buckled. Now there's the possibility that not only do you have buckling, but there's no lateral support, so the, the beam could essentially just, uh, I guess, uh, uh, flop side to side. So this, of course, is a, the weakest of all of the possibilities. So it only works for half as much beam. This two doesn't mean that you can make a beam twice as long and it's just as good. It means you can only make a beam half as long because of that double. Alright then, so we'll look at our last problem of the year. And you can decide just what just what type of uh, uh, loading it represents. So we have a beam here that in cross section is three by two oriented in that direction, eight feet long. with uh, a cable support there attached um, six feet above the uh, wall anchor. And it needs to support some particular weight, so you need to determine what that is. Make the beam out of, uh, oh, sorry, 6061 T6 aluminum. And we'll use it. A D of uh, 10 times 10 to the 6 PSI. and an allowable normal stress of 37 KSI. So the yield normal stress or the allowable limit, 37 KSI. Okay, so I think that's all the pieces there. Yep, and that's okay. So, find W.
cable I got from Pearl and Ace Hardware. So it will not stretch, it will not fail. All we're looking at is the buckling and that beam itself. consider Watching in the car while I was driving. <laughs> no, well, 
Miami never go to Virginia. That's the only time it slipped out. I let it kind of keep catching it in my head. But, uh, I apologize. I bet not clapping it. So, I mean, she doesn't take it so long. I screw up her name. I don't know. Uh, you need to determine from that, from the statics, what the critical load is. E, you've got. Uh, I, you do not have. LE, you have to decide from one of these possible situations. Oh, I, you do have. I forgot, we gave you the cross section. Um, so, uh, you determine what the load will be when you have all the stuff on that side. But, which condition do you think LE is? Got something, Frank? Um, no, that Frank. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Is there sort of what? Oh, uh, is there a moment? Any moment where? Uh, well, yeah, of course there is. Because we have a couple forces involved that don't pass through that point, so there must be some moment there. I don't know that you need to look at it. What? Yeah, but but uh, remember the MC or I was part of this. Part we looked at the bending moment in the beam, which is different than the moment about A. We looked at the bending moment in the in the in the beam MC over I. That's how we got. To here, that's how I got in here when we developed that last Friday. <coughs> Bobby? No? You relate these by doing a force balance. That's got to equal to the W you don't know, which will make W a factor P. And then you can um, solve for a W that is within that critical load limit. Which one do you think it is? Clearly not the first, because it's embedded at this end. It's clearly not the, the third, because there's no moment support at that end from, from the loading. So it only leaves the second and the fourth as possibilities. So a couple of you thought it was the second one? Anybody think it was the fourth one? I don't know why though. I don't know. I think about that much. <laughs> I don't know. 
you, as, you, as you approach your professional careers, there's some things you might actually want to say out loud. Okay. Right. Even if they're cooking around in here, <laughs> you don't want to just shrug and go, I don't know what I'm doing. Just guessing. Well, the, the question I guess is, is, is there any possibility of that end going that way? If we look at this from above, then we have the beam and the wire running down like that, but that's where the tension is that's causing this, this load that gives us the possibility of buckling. Is there anything available to keep the, that beam end from going left or right? You know, if, if we consider the ideal situation, this this cable has no possibility of uh, stretching in it. If the beam happened to deflect a little bit to one side or the other. Then the cable, can the cable prevent that? Is the question. Against direction. And when in doubt, you need to go to the more conservative choice to make it an even safer uh, design. So if in doubt, which one of these is the more conservative? Number four. Um, I don't see that for this design there's any reason that the end couldn't go side to side. So uh, in my mind that was load uh, uh, support situation four. Um, we've, you've probably seen cases where those kind of beam or those kind of uh, you know, a sign or something might have uh, two cables running like that. Now that is a situation where we have to take that the end can't go one way or the other because one cable will prevent it from going the opposite way each time. So I think you were right, Pat. Yeah. That was the reason I had. I just did not explain it so clearly. Well, you're not a professional explainer. So there actually be three cables on that one. On that? Yeah. No, there'd be two. Is that a top view or? Yeah, that's the top view. Uh, so th this the single cable that goes down. Wait, is that a top view? Both are. The, the the problem, the big one. No, this is a side view. Okay. Looking at from top, though, with the cable right and right down the center, I don't see any reason why the end of it couldn't couldn't move laterally. And to prevent the end from moving laterally, and then you can put two cables again here, seen from above. Okay. Above pictures are always smaller. So if we had a problem like that one that you just drew up there, that's smaller than two cables, uh -huh. could it move up and down at the end? In which case, we would still use the same T or two L. Well, don't forget though that there's a, a tendency of this thing to buckle this way much more than this way. And so if you're concerned with the possibility of it bucking, buckling up or down, then you have to take into account the other direction on the cross section for the moment of inertia. Right, remember we looked at that on Friday yeah. as a possibility. If this was a, a square cross section, then there'd be no preference for which direction would be the buckle, and you have to look at it in both directions. Do we have to make the, um, the base in this one three and the height two because that, that would give us the smallest moment of the Yeah, the, the possibility that the, the uh, R, Y is less than R, Z, so it's more likely to buckle with the, the, the beam actually moving in, in or out. It's more likely to buckle in the upwards direction, uh, from the upwards view.
than it would be from the side view. Doobie, okay, that seem reasonable? No? I don't know. What's the trouble? So, Pat, did you work it to the end to come? Uh, I did. I got 105 units. Okay. Looking at the, the end of the beam, we've got a T there, W there. Those are the, the, the weight and the cable response to that. And some load there. And that's the uh, axial load that we're going to need to see on the uh, uh, that the beam needs to prevent and uh, because of the shape of the triangle it should come out that P equals four thirds W just based on the, the uh, statics of that that end piece So then we can solve then for I and I equals in uh, the lesser uh, lesser direction. What's I? Do we have does somebody have that? I don't think I have that specific number. I have, I have that R Y uh, R where we use the uh, the, uh, the slenderness ratio. Paper I have to have using that version of it. So maybe you didn't. Gyration. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Too many steps at once. Then we have A already. L E. I hope we agreed on then is is uh, two. Take that through. Would it, would it work? Just use like this one instead of the area stuff. Does it cancel out? Okay. Yeah, because remember the radius of gyration of I over squared I over A. Uh, if you 
put it in there, then that gives L over R squared. So these are these are still the same thing, just slightly different versions of, uh, of the same one. F W equals four thousand sixteen times. W equals 4,016, something like that. Four thousand sixteen. Then did you check for possible normal stress failure? superpositions. 